So hyperpigmentation is the most difficult thing that we deal with. When it's post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, we can hit home runs. When it's pigmentation due to actinic damage, we can hit home runs. When it comes to chronic pigmentation, such as melasma, we just pray. That's all we can do. And it's a chronic thing. Remember, it's just like if you have diabetes, hypertension. It doesn't just disappear. It's a question of how can we manage it? How can we manage expectations? So I'll share some of the things that are coming out now. Again, nothing has changed since yesterday. I haven't signed on with any new clinical trials yet, but I'd like to. When you understand the concept of melanogenesis, everything else falls into place. Most of you in the room are adept at understanding what's going on from a histological standpoint, and anything that's going to activate the melanocyte activity or increase the melanocyte activity, which then upregulates the production of pigment, which then goes into melanophage, uh, melanosomes and then gets risen up through the epidermal layer, is what's going to cause hyperpigmentation. That's important. What do we know? There's pigmentary variances depending on what your genetic makeup is. So there's a big difference between eumelanin and pheomelanin, right? But everybody, and this was surprising to me, even this far out, everybody has the same number of melanocytes, but it's all based on what are your melanocytes programmed to produce, right? And so we know that eumelanin is gonna be dense, it's gonna be brown, black, Pheomelanin is going to be more like those redheads that are sitting next to you where they have the freckles that form rather than the pigmentation that I can form. And so these pigmentary variances are very important because you can see the melanosomes in darkly pigmented skin versus those who have light pigmented skin. And this, this is what's going to regulate hyperpigmentation. So let's all come about that and understand that first. Of course, there's different types of pigmentation, and this is just repeat for you. There's UV-induced, actinic, so you can see the difference that occurs over time as we continue to mature and have birthdays. We have post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Again, we have so many tools in our toolbox to help with this. Some are going to be our over-the-counter brighteners. Some are going to be just using retinoids. And of course, we have tools within our toolbox in the office, so that's going to be your chemical peels, your if you want to use a laser. And even just honestly, microdermabrasion, we have um, different devices. And if you talk brand names, there's hydrofacial, there's uh, diamond peel, there's a whole bunch that are out there that we can use as microderm and suction devices. This again, this melasma, cloasma, is the most difficult thing that we treat, at least in our practice. If I can, I try to refer it out to Baylor because Dr. Rosen knows a, whole more, a lot more about this than I do. But we get to treat some of the, the the device side, let's put it that way. When somebody has resistant melasma, what can we do? But of course, we're gonna talk some medical as well. So when you look at this lovely lady, and she's a news reporter in Vegas, what type of pigmentation does she have? You can see she definitely has some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation because she does have hormonal acne or adult acne. She has some melasma that you can see on the cheeks. And when we talk about what is melasma, look for this symmetric pigmentation that it goes on. Where are the characteristic areas? It's gonna be the upper lip, the forehead, around the uh, infraorbital uh, foramen there. And then there's different patterns of melasma. Does it really matter? No. It's just for esoteric purposes that you know what these are. But one of the things that I think is interesting, we got referred this, actually it's a, a personal friend, he's a dentist, we, I've known him some, since residency, and he came and he kept going to his general dermatologist, so like, hey, Sunil, can you help me find the right person? Because originally he had sent me a text six months before that saying, what do you suggest for hypersensitive skin when you're shaving? And I said, I don't know, let me ask one of the general derms in our area. And so we gave him all that stuff, but I didn't pay attention. I was in the middle of a conference and I wasn't really thinking about what, why he was asking me this. And so finally he came in, I'm looking at it, and I did a um, FaceTime consult with one of our general derms. And I said, this is what I think it is, but it looks kind of weird. And she says, um, I think it is, and it's poikiloderma of savant with an overlap with melasma. Again, what are some of the most common causes that we talk about? And these are really genetic predisposition, but there's exacerbating factors. So that's going to be hormone changes, whether it's due to natural or uh, iatrogenic. But more importantly, there's also heat, and that's something to think about. When we talk about the impact to our patients, again, I always think back and say, what is it that, that bothers people? And some of these numbers have changed, especially with the COVID-19 that some of us have gained. 
actually 79% of the country, unfortunately. Um, so things change, but you can see on there that skin texture and discoloration is a big problem. And we have some traditional things that we do. We have the topical agents, we have our chemical peels, and understanding how these chemical compositions can work. We have some historic laser therapies, and I'm gonna talk about something that's new that's just come on the market. And so what are our li limitations with our topical therapy? Well, we have great ideas. We have hydroquinone, it works well. And somebody had asked on the app, did you know that hydroquinone is being uh, FDA, it's being pulled off the shelves because of the FDA. So if you don't know that, that is in play. This has happened since March of last year. So a lot of the topicals uh, that you're talking about, whether you get it as a medical grade or a um, cosmeceutical grade, or even just over the counter in pharmacies, your um, CVS, wherever else that you're gonna shop, they're pulled off the shelf, or they should be pulled off the shelf because the FDA has come down hard on it. Japan, they got pulled a long time ago. Europe, they got pulled almost 10 years ago because of theoretical concerns, right? Azelaic acid, and what's the long-term effect with hydroquinone? If you use it on a regular basis with no periods of rest, we do see exogenous ochronosis. So what is that? It's a fancy way of saying you're gonna get permanent hyperpigmentation, and that's a nuisance. Uh, Dr. Mullen Manivali has shared some of his cases where he uses 1064 nanometer wavelength, some with the Pico, some with the, the Q-switch um, that he uses, and there's some improvement, but it's brutal. It's really brutal. Azelaic acid, it's a little bit irritating short term. Retinoids, the problem is patient compliance. Why is there a problem with patient compliance? Because they, it dries them out. I don't know if Dr. Harper is here, but I'm gonna use my Bucuchiol for the day. So one of those things that we can do is we can give them Bucuchiol or an alternative that's not gonna irritate them. Of course, sunscreen. What sunscreen should we use for anybody who has melasma? It should be a physical sunblock, so that's your titanium dioxide, your zinc oxide, everybody's nodding their head, they're like, yes, you idiot, we know that. But what else, do we do what else may you not know? If you use a tinted sunscreen, it's actually more effective. There's only one sunscreen, I can't say the brand name because this is CME talk, but you can uh, DM me later, I'll give you my address, um, it's just at Refresh Derm on, on Instagram, and I will be happy to share the brand. It actually has something that counteracts the heat protein that activates and hyperreacts, uh, or hyperactivates the melanocyte. And so it's, uh, it's wild gooseberry. It's Physalia auriculosa is the actual ingredient that's inside there. So this is what happens with the overuse of hydroquinone. You can see there's a dramatic change that goes on, and this is permanent, or as permanent as it's gonna be with the skin, right? And uh, even if you don't uh, go back into the sun, you stop the hydroquinone, this is extremely difficult to get rid of. So what other options do we have? We talk about topical options. And people were writing on the app, hey, I've heard about this cysteamine. What is this? Well, in 2012, Centis finally figured out a way to stabilize this highly unstable molecule. And it's called cysteamine. The problem, as Dr. Harper talked about yesterday, it has, as the marketing people like to say, an unusual scent. It stinks, it's like cat pee, okay? That's what I say to patients. This stinks, leave it on for 15 minutes, and I'm gonna show you the, the protocol on how to use it. Um, leave it on for 15 minutes, wash it off, and then put your nice fragrant moisturizer on top so you can go back to bed and you don't throw anybody away. So cysteamine is, cysteamine is not something new. This has been around for more than 50 years. This is originally uh, discovered by using fish scales. And in 1966, this is when Professor Chauvin first described this activity of something. And what we, know, what we know is that it's a highly unstable molecule, it's very malodorous, and so the question becomes how can we counteract both of those things? We know that in vitro studies, right? Not in vivo, but in vitro studies, there's an 80% reduction of melanin, melanin synthesis. So it's doing something. Let me see if I can go to the next slide. Okay, good. A lot of people, especially in California, and now coming to Texas with all this mess with political stuff and with the COVID, Dr. Rosen, keep them out of Texas, please. Good Lord, I mean, the questions that I'm starting to get these days is terrible. But they wanna know, is this something that's, that's natural? Yes, it's produced by the human body. Yes, it's produced in nature, we see it in fish. Yes, it's also produced by humans in breast milk. So is it natural? Yes. 
How does it actually work? If you want to, remember I always, I said yesterday, I'm always going to give you one slide that you might want to take a picture of. This is that slide, okay? Because it's just an understanding of how the pathway works for melanogenesis. And in particular, if you understand where the variables are, it gives you an idea what ingredients are we looking for to actually stop that portion of the pathway. So what does it do? It does inhibit uh, tyrosinase, uh, I'm sorry, ty tyrosine hydroxylation. It does inhibit DOPA oxidation, right? And you can read this, it's not that exciting for, for me to read it to you out loud. Everybody has uh, passed their, their boards. What do we know? Some of these are gonna be overlap. So if I can do tyrosinase inhibit, inhibition as well as hydroquinone, would it change our concept of what we can do for melasma or chronic pigmentation? I think so. Yesterday, Dr. Harper talked about silimerin. I love just saying the name. So now I use Bacuchiol, oh, I did it twice, and silimerin inside this discussion. So silimerin and niacinamide, what they'll do, they're both anti-inflammatories, they're both anti-erythema. Uh, they'll decrease erythema and inflammation. And remember, with any of these pigmentary disorders, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have upregulation of the, the inflammatory response. So it's just something to think about. Somebody had asked, what are our other agents that we can be using? For whoever asked that question, this is the slide that you wanna take a photograph of because we have a lot of different agents. Somebody else on the app asked about transemic acid. Does topical transemic acid work? We have three over-the-counter or professional-grade products, if you want to call it, from different companies, including one that's being represented here. It has black in the background, so go look at them and see what it is that they're offering with topical transemic acid. Somebody asked, what's the effectiveness of this? Eh. I think it's something else that we're putting on because when it comes to melasma especially or hyperpigmentation, I'm gonna put everything but the kitchen sink at that patient. And does it help? I think in the proper concentrations. So with some compounding, some people are using a, I think it's a 12 or 16% transemic acid to, to put in topically. But again, we don't know is it actually doing something. Somebody else on the app asked, should we use oral transemic acid and what's the dosage? So a trans, oral transemic acid is used commonly in gynecology because when there's excessive bleeding, you can decrease that bleeding. We also use it in plastic surgery. So if I'm doing a facelift or if I'm doing something where I'm expecting a lot of bleeding, let's say it's, it's a mass abdominoplasty, you can locally inject that transemic acid to improve the clotting. So if you think about the mechanism, what is that gonna do? It's gonna improve your clotting, it's gonna decrease the blood flow into that particular area, and one of the things that happens with melasma is you're gonna get hyperemia. You're gonna actually have a baseline increased vascularity, so we have to be cautious about that. Um, and you know, when you talk about this in comparison with the hydroquinone, here's the, the risks and benefits. There's different things that we can use, and we do know that it's safe. So in terms of publications, again, I told you yesterday I'm a super geek. I want to make sure that there's at least some published data, and it doesn't necessarily translate to clinical, but we do know that there's several publications that show that there's some efficacy. In terms of this particular one, if you want to look this up, in uh, British Journal of Dermatology, they really showed a nice effectiveness using in all uh, skin, mainly skin types three and four and different age groups that are inside there. And what they showed with this particular study, there was a 16, 67% decrease in the melanin index in melasma with cystiamine. Okay, not that exciting, fine. So again, this is just from that study and just shows that yes, it improves the skin. Otherwise, we wouldn't put it up here. Oftentimes, we're using a modified Kligman's formula to improve that pigmentation again. And we found that when we added cystiamine, it worked better. And in some cases, if we switch them over from the modified Kligman's, it actually cleared this um, certain patients. Okay, so in clinical use, what do we do? This is a short contact, and somebody asked, I think on the app, or maybe it was in, in person, can you keep cystamine on overnight? You can, the problem is it's oftentimes quite irritating. The one thing that you want to remember is you want to put it on a day-old skin, let's put it that way. So before you wash, go ahead and put this on, or if it's first thing in the morning, put it on for 15 minutes, and then wash it off. That short contact seems to be less irritating, and again, we don't want to cause increased inflammation in a patient with melasma. 
Okay, so all this is just marketing nonsense. Yes, it's well tolerated, otherwise we wouldn't talk about it. So here's some examples of using uh, cysteamine, 15 minute application. You can see that the before and the after it improves. Again, here's a patient, this is courtesy of Corey Hartman. He's in Birmingham, Alabama, and you can see there's an improvement in his patient. This is a case with Shino, um, Shino Bay Aguilera. He's just a great guy, and this is somebody who's been suffering from from uh, melasma and chronic melasma, hyperpigmentation for a long time, so it's improves. So what else can we use it for? We can use it for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. I'm gonna be giving a talk uh, in about a month showing how it's an early stage study showing that maybe it improves lentigenes as well. Eh. I don't know, I haven't seen that in clinical practice, at least in our practice, but we do see that there's other things that are out there. So what other options do we have now? We talk about laser therapies and things like that. We can use chemical peels. Again, these are extremely inexpensive, and so you can customize it for that patient. This is an ingredient list for typical things that we use for hyperpigmentation. Of course, you can use typical hydroquinone, uh, TCA. I use all of these in our practice. And again, for the person who asked on the app, what ingredients are we looking for? These are all of those ingredients. And all you need to understand is really what are you performing? Is it a superficial peel, a medium depth peel, or a deep peel? And I would suggest for, for anybody who has hyperpigmentation, stick with something that's a superficial peel or a very light superficial peel. The medium peels you can do, but you just want to be cautious because it can cause more hyperpigmentation. And what ends up happening, they look great for about a week or two weeks. And I, you know, if I ever get a chance to share complications, I'll share one of those patients where we did a more aggressive peel than we should have. And in terms of the depth of the peel, it's based on where is it absorbing into. So you just need to understand that. Right? So here's one of those ingredients. It's an alpha hydroxy acid that you can, you can use. You can use it for every skin type, and it depends on what percentage that you want to, to improve. Beta hydroxy acid, and of course, you're seeing some topicals that have alpha and beta hydroxy acid. The only thing, if you're going to use an AHA, BHA with the patient topically, like it's a take home, make sure they don't put it on at the same time as the retinol because the acidity will actually denigrate the, the retinol. TCA, this is what I use all the time. It's inexpensive, it works great. You can order from Delasco, McKesson, and, and figure out which one, what um, percentage that you want. Typically, we'll start with a 10 or 15%, and if we can, we can work our way up. And what's the frequency? Typically three to four weeks, depending on what the patient's skin is able to tolerate. But before we spend any money in the office, I will always have that person on a retinol or a retinoid of some sort, and definitely the proper sunscreen. Uh, retinoids can be added at the end of one of your chemical peels with whichever agent that you're using and that'll enhance the results. So again, do something that's progressive, not aggressive, and you have decreased downtime. So here's just an example, just using um, two, you know, different types of peels in combination on this patient. And this is one month later after the first peel, so it improves. Um, so anyway, there's lots of uses for chemical peels. You just have to be cautious because you can cause some damage as well. This is hyperpigmentation that was caused by an overaggressive peel. So in terms of technology, what else can we use? Well, historically, we have Q-switch lasers, we have fractionated lasers, IPL, and we always talk about what's the caution that we want. And somebody asked this on the app as well. Well. Can you do IPL? Yes, you can. You just have to understand laser physics or light physics, and that's important because you don't want to cause too much heat. Are you prepping the skin? We've shown in multiple publications that even if you prep the skin, people say, oh, do hydroquinone for six weeks before. We haven't seen any improvement in decrease or any decrease in those uh, side effects. And so this is what can happen quite often. This is an IPL burn, but this can happen to anybody. We see it with hair removal as well. And it's just, it's difficult. Right, because now this person is coming in and maybe they went to a practitioner or a med spa where they don't know as much about the technology and it's a big mess. Here's again with, uh, this is a long pulsed NDAG laser. We also see with this Alex lasers that this can happen as well. So just be a little bit cautious, please. Somebody was asking, what's your favorite laser technology? Well, I can use a um, NDAG most often is what I'm gonna be using. I use a longer uh, 650 microsecond um, wavelength that we showed an example of that it uses, it's quite useful for a lot of different things because it's gonna bypass the surface pigment and aim for a little bit deeper. In melasma, you have to remember that we're targeting the pigment, we're targeting the vascularity that's underneath there as well. And then again, what Dr. Mona Valley was talking about yesterday where we're using the um, laser genesis, where it's a longer, um, it's a microsecond pulse rather than a millisecond pulse, you can improve the texture of the skin as well. 
So there's lots of different uses here that's not that exciting. And what happens if we do a singular treatment versus combination treatment? Well, you guys, oftentimes it's synergistic, just like you would expect. So there's things that you can do, but definitely, definitely add, add at-home skin care. Now that Dr. Harper's here, I want to make sure she understands that I used Bukuchi already twice in this talk. And if you want to do an at-home and somebody is super sensitive, they have rosacea or they have a lot of erythema as well as their hyperpigmentation, put them on a Bukuchiol product. Was that good? Okay. Um, so here's an example of using a 650 microsecond. Oh, I guess the, that's okay. It, I guess the laser, will you see if you can play that video? Maybe the video didn't, nah, it's okay. No, not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Uh, but here's just an example of using one of those treatments and you can see there's an improvement using this, plus also using a peel that has hydroquinone with resorcinol. And the reason for resorcinol, that's gonna generate heat. So if you have a melasma patient, don't do anything that's gonna generate too much heat, okay? That can uh, worsen this. Here's an example of using, it's just a brand called Ultra Peel One. So it's a lighter TCA, it's TCA 12%. Here's an example of what can be done where, again, you're using the 650 microsecond NDAG to break up some of the pigment to also decrease the vascularity, and then we can put a glycolic peel right on top, and this is courtesy of uh, Dr. Burgess, Cheryl Burgess, who's out of uh, DC. So again, we have things that can work, and we see that it works quite effectively. Uh, here's an example because, again, before you spend $100,000 or $200,000 on a, a, a piece of equipment, what can we do without that? Something that you may already have in your office. Here's an example where we use just microdermabrasion, which everybody probably has in their office, and then we combined it with a 5% hydroquinone. Again, you could buy this on Amazon, really, and uh, do it through your, your practice. There's different companies. Um, see me afterwards, and I can ha be happy to share that with you. And then, of course, using Systeme. And look at the nice change. Pretty remarkable. Here's another case. This is using just plain collagen induction therapy, so using it as a drug delivery system and then doing a light chemical peel. Be super cautious when you do this. People often ask, what, um, which one should you do first? If you don't know what you're doing or you don't understand the depth of the skin, do the chemical peel first and then do your microneedling and then you can put your topical agent on top. If you're gonna use a vitamin C or E, then um, it, that does sting like a son of a gun. So you may wanna wait 24 hours before you put it on or wait till that evening when you see some of those microchannels are actually closed like with the discussion that we had yesterday. So what's new, because I have two minutes left, there's something called pulsed radiofrequency microneedling. So we discussed very, very briefly yesterday radiofrequency microneedling in terms of using it for acne scars. So there's a device that we, it should be coming on Monday that we're gonna actually text, uh, test it personally here in the States. It's been used in Korea and in some of the Far East. And here's how we think it might work. So again, I wanna understand why is the pathology, what's the pathophysiology, why should something work? And what they found is by doing biopsies in those areas of normal skin versus those that have hyperpigmentation, specifically melasma, they found more senescent cells. Senescent cells are not apoptotic cells. They're not programmed to be just taken away. They're resting, right? and we're trying to bring them back. And so the question becomes, can we use something different? And so from a theoretical standpoint, yes. If you can go at 300 microns, that's about the layer, that's about the depth to get to the, the basement membrane or the DJ. And if we use a pulsed wave, can we improve the vascularity and improve the basement membrane, decrease transepidermal water loss without Bucuchiol, and improve the overall skin? See Dr. Harper four times today. I'm done for my day. I think some of that quota should go over tomorrow. So here's what it looks like. There's most everything else that's in the US right now. There's 19 different devices that have radio frequency microneedling. And you can use insulated, uninsulated needles, figure out what you want to do. But they're all continuous wave. There's one that's short pulse wave that came out um, in 2016, 2017. Now this one is a new one that's just come out this year and it uses a pulse wave. It's very, very difficult to get something that's gonna penetrate properly without the bounce back at 300 microns. So again, this is theory. We see results in, in Asia. Let's figure out if it works. I have 12 seconds left. Here's my clinical pearls. People said, they asked on the app, what's my typical regimen? I put every single person on some type of retinol. If they can't uh, tolerate the retinol, I will use the Bucuccio, and that was on, not on purpose, but I, that's what we do. Uh, I definitely use a, a physical sunblock with a tint. I use this, um, you can use a mineral brush 
One company is ISDN, the other company is Color Science. You can even order, you can even get it at Costco, so it's something else to think about. I'm gonna enhance outcomes by giving that person something to do at home. I will not treat them, unless I'm doing complimentary treatment, on that first visit. I want the person to partner with me. I wanna make sure that they're gonna do their homework at home, and if they're on their skincare regimen and they come back at the two to six week mark, I know that they're serious about it. Remember, it takes 21 days to make something a habit. It takes um, three and a half months to make something part of your lifestyle. So some tips and pearls, if you don't have something like a Vizio, or this one's called Capture, it's very inexpensive, use that. This is the developer of this, uh, or the distributor of this, and he's out of Dallas, and I don't remember what it was, but it cost a whole lot less than the Vizio, and it's something that at least you have some, some details there. So with questions, I'm gonna be offline, I'm gonna be around all day, and of course you can always DM me at Refresh Derm. Thanks so much for having me.